Good afternoon everybody and welcome aboard the afternoon safari and welcome to especially the Trantwood and Shelton Park Elementary Schools. We've come out this afternoon and we've just found ourselves a left Edmund. My name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera we've got Davi. How's it, Davi? Welcome aboard, kiddies. We've been able to find ourselves a leopard. And her name is Shudulu. And don't forget to send us your questions through your teacher. And send us your questions and your comments. Because we'd love for you to be involved with us. With this beautiful leopard that we found this morning had managed to kill herself an impala for breakfast. So she's now quite warm in the afternoon. It's a lovely mid day uh, just heading on into the afternoon nice and warm and uh, well you can see she's a little bit tired after all the effort that she's put in to kill that impala and also that it's nice and warm now Yanasha, the way that we identify the leopards is that we look at how big the head is and then we also look closer and we see if there's any small things that we can see, like the different spots on them. And if we can't see any particular differences, then we'll look very closely at those little spots that are just above the whiskers there. And if you see just next to the nose, how many spots can we count? On each side, that top line, one, two, three, four, five. There's one little spot above the rest, but there's, and there's two almost going into one another, but there's five little spots on each side of the nose. Can you see that? One, two, three, four, and then one just above it. And so that's the way that we can identify between different leopards that are very much, uh, that they look almost exactly the same. So everyone, it's very exciting. We're going to stay here with this leopard, this female leopard, see what she does. But I tell you what, it's very exciting because David, our Kenyan friend, is also out on a vehicle. And it seems he's, he's found some of those sinister birds. Hello, everyone, and all the school, board, school kids, welcome to our sunset drive this afternoon coming to you all the way from South Africa and my name is David and on the camera is VM. What a great gentleman, what a team we are making with VM and we just started by seeing some very big birds on top of that tree and VM will take you back to those big birds all the way up there and we're going to discuss them in uh, in a way that you'll understand what they are. These birds are very, very important in the wilderness. And what these birds do, they help clean my office. They help clean our office. What I'm saying here, they help clean the savannah, they help clean the wilderness, or what is out here. If any animal would die, just like Raf, who has a leopard that had made a kill, what that leopard will leave behind, it will need to be cleaned by someone. And that cleaning is done by these big birds here that we call vultures. Would compare them to your, I would say, garbage collectors back home. They help clean nature and everything remains clean. Those vultures just show them, we've got two types of them. We'll show them again to you. One is called the hooded vulture, and the other one, yes, well done, VM. And the one to the right, that's a little whitish, is called very good. So one that's on the right of your screen, those three there, those are the hooded vultures. All right? If you move to the right a little bit there, VM, that one there is called the white-backed vulture. So I want to show you in one minute what exactly these vultures do and we have started on a good note. We might now have a little bit sad note and I'm holding my nose because of the, the smell coming out of here and all the flies that are coming up here. This was found here by my colleague James Henry two days ago and we have been trying to explore what might have killed this animal here and this animal here is called an impala and I can tell you before we end the drive or before we end the school drive we might see a live one. 
It's a male because you all know males got horns for the impalas. Females have no horns. Now, we are yet to know who killed this impala, but by yesterday, the body was whole and complete. When James came back here this morning, the body was eaten by half. So we think, we are not very sure, it could be a leopard or a hyena or maybe a civet. Now, if all those animals will be done with it, what will be remaining here will be cleaned by those vultures that are there. We don't know what time they'll be coming back here, so we're going to leave this situation as it is and let the vultures come and clean all this and then my office or our wilderness will smell good again. Right. So back to the car and then we leave the vultures, see if they continue eating. When we got here, none of them was eating, but again, we do not know the animal that killed it, the predator, how far it is. And for that reason, maybe the vultures are still scared of coming down. And if the predator is close by, the vultures come down, she or he will like, Shh, get out of my dinner. All right, please kids, do not forget to ask us questions. Do not talk to us and, and that teachers will be asking us the questions. And we got another gentleman who is walking in the bush. Hello everybody. My name is James and I'm whispering like this because we are looking for a lion on this road. Now lions, if you see them on foot, well, normally they just run away, but sometimes they can be a little bit more angry with us. And so we're talking very quietly so that we don't surprise him. You can ask any questions, same as you can with the other two. And what we're looking for over here is tracks of the male lion. And then we're going to listen carefully to see if we hear him going, because that's a terrifying sound to hear. Now, we're not doing this because it's dangerous. We're doing this because we want to try and find this wonderful male lion. Now, excellent news is that Shidulu, that beautiful female leopard, is coming to visit us in our camp. So everyone, we're just trying to keep up with Shadulu here. She's actually heading straight towards where our camp is. And so it's not very easy for us to get a nice view on her as she moves through the grass. But we're going to have to keep on trying. And it's not always easy to keep up with leopards. And you see how well camouflaged they are. I'm going to have to maybe toke the road around. Sam, generally the males are quite a bit bigger than the females, especially their head. But now I'm going to have to just catch up with her. I think I need to go straight down this road because I just saw her heading back towards our camp. So we need to be quick because if she gets out of view, sometimes they can disappear. Now remember, we are heading down towards our camp. So you might see a little bit of our camp. Um, I'm just hoping that she stays on an area that we can actually see her. There she is, she's coming through to our camp. There she turned around now. Yes, they, they are nearly at the top. More is lions above them. Um, but now she's going to go into a very thick drainage line. Um, oh, she might go onto that fire break. So this is our yeah, just think about that everyone. Be watching one. You might be watching a leopard from your tent. I think I know where she's going to go. Just through onto this little area which is like a fire break. Just coming through here. I'm sure we'll see her cross here, but I don't know if I'll be able to actually get through because of that electric fence. Let's just see. If she goes through there or if she turns back. There she is. You can hear some squirrels making a lot of noise. They're all calling at the leopard.
Now, Melody, a leopard is very powerful. They would uh, be able to hurt a very big, strong man. And so we need to be very careful of it. But um, they can also take down big impala and my small kudu. So they are very strong. Sorry about that, Ralph is still following the leopard. Leopard's not far, actually just through this bush over here, but Ralph's going to find it difficult to follow in the car, but I'm sure she's going to pop out at that water hole that we were walking towards just now. Now, we're going to turn around and carry on going this way, because well, there are no tracks of our male lion here, and we might actually pick up the leopard as she comes to have a drink. Anyway, very exciting stuff. I'm still going to talk nice and quietly so that we don't surprise any animals that we might find here. Whew. Very exciting to be out here. <laughs> now, Lanasha, you have probably been reading about cave lions and so you're wondering if the lions here live in caves no they don't we don't have caves here really this is a very ancient landscape which means we don't have much rock at all it's mostly sand and so there aren't any caves in the United States obviously where you live there used to be a kind of a lion called a cave lion but it wasn't quite the same as the lions that we get here it was even bigger and that used to live in caves when it got very cold but never gets very cold here so the lions don't actually have to live in caves which is very nice for them and for us because we see them more often but the cave lion is now extinct doesn't exist anymore and used to live in the United States I hope not, Melody. You say do lions eat humans? No, they can from time to time, but normally they don't. You know, it's the same thing as saying, do sharks eat humans? Uh, a lot of people think lots of sharks eat human beings, uh, but only four human beings in the whole world are eaten by sharks every year. Now, we're going to walk a bit faster, and even fewer than that probably are eaten by lions. We're going to walk quickly because this leopard is coming down to have a drink here. Let's go quickly around the corner. We might get very lucky because to see a cat on foot is tremendous. Elia, a water hole is like a well. It's a place where animals can come and drink. It's like a big puddle in the ground where there's water for the animals to come and have a drink. And on a hot day like this, 82 degrees odd Celsius, well, at least Fahrenheit, they will come and have a drink. So now we can just hear the radio going crazy, everybody trying to find the animals. Very exciting stuff. We're not far, we're only one minute away from the waterhole, and we might get very lucky. Imagine we saw a lion and a leopard on foot. That would be very exciting. The reason we walk on foot and not in a car is because it gives us a better chance to see the tracks and also just feel so nice, feel so nice to be on foot and feel the touching the grass on your legs like this and feeling the leaves and smelling the different smells and being able to hear things that you can't in the vehicle. Okay, we're approaching the waterhole now. We've got to watch out for buffalo and that sort of thing on a hot day like this. Now, Lily, yes, there are different types of leopard, but not different types here. In South Africa, we only have one type of leopard. Let's move down through here so we can see the waterhole. Now, we would there's the waterhole. Let me just come and stand over here. We would expect the leopard to come out on a path that we walked on just now. We'll just wait here and see if she doesn't come out. Lily, there are different kinds of leopards in some other parts of the world. This leopard, called Panthera pardus, you'll learn about that later, extends all the way into Russia. But then you get something like snow leopards, which are not very closely related, but they are related to our leopards here. And they live in the mountains of the Himalaya. And that's, you get something called a Sunda clouded leopard, which you'd find in Borneo. Also not very closely related to our leopards here. Now what we're going to see 
is just to the right hand side of where our water hole is, we might see the cat coming out. And the Maya, I'll answer that question for you. I'm just going to stay, walk a little bit forward very carefully and show you this thing here. You want to know if other animals use the water hole? This disgusting pile of poop is made by a buffalo. And buffalo love to use this water hole. Isn't that disgusting? You can see why they have to use the water hole. Because, well, they drink a lot of water. That's why their poop is so wet. Let's just stand here in the shade and see if she doesn't pop out. You have to be very patient out here in the bush. Because if you're not patient, you can miss things. And it's very easy to miss a leopard. You saw how beautifully camouflaged she was. I can hear a vehicle trying to drive through this way, but they're really going to struggle. What we'd be looking for there is a little flash of white from her tail, or some spots coming through. Isabella? Did Ralph not show you what they ate? Isabella, they like to eat impala. They eat any kind of meat, really. But they'll eat impala and steenbok and dica. And sometimes, if they're really hungry, they'll eat fish and terrapins, which are like sort of freshwater turtles. And they'll eat lizards from time to time, and even termites if they're very hungry. So they have what we know as a Catholic diet. It's called a Catholic diet. Now, I know this can be a little bit boring, but it's very important that we are patient out here. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, we're going to wait here. Ralph has found the maker of that big wet patty. Yes, it is indeed. Thanks, James. This is the buffalo. And what did the buffalo do best? Apart from making massive poos, they also like wallowing in the mud, especially when it's very hot like it is today. So this is a buffalo. It's the Cape buffalo. Very similar, almost the same as your North American bison. Um, but uh, a little bit different in that they don't have as much hair because it's not as cold here. It's quite a lot hotter. So the bison, is uh, uh, he's uh, got lots of hair to keep him warm in the snow and in the cold. But the buffalo, he's got no hair and he's got a very thin, uh, or thinner skin as well. Now, Annabelle, this is one of the ways that animals adapt to the weather. When it's very hot, you have lots of animals that go and wallow in the mud, like elephants and buffalo, and even the very pretty, or some would say, the very ugly warthogs. And other animals too. Lots of the birds, they'll go down and splash water over themselves, and that will help clean their feathers, but also to cool them down. And well, look at this buffalo. He's like in a big uh, swimming pool with a little bit of mud. And so when he leaves the, the water hole, he takes that mud with him. Liam and buffalo are very powerful. They can uh, even chase lions away. Now, very exciting. Shudulu, the leopard, has gone exactly where I thought she would. Oh, yes, I've got her. She's come out, everybody. Look. Now, what, she has seen us. But what we don't want is to give her a fright, so we're just going to stand right here. Oh, isn't that too special? Look how beautiful she is. Now what she's doing is she's watching us because she's trying to decide if it's safe for her to come and drink while we're waiting here. Now she's just going off into the shade. Not us. Herbert, who's our tracker and game scout and protector, he says that she has spotted something else, maybe an impala, not us. He doesn't think she's worried about us. Nasha, we know she's ready to hunt when she looks hungry. Unlike human beings who don't get thin when we get hungry, right? You can still be fat and hungry. A cat like this gets thin very quickly. 
And so if they're hungry, they're very skinny. That's how you know that they want to eat quite soon. Let's try to see if I can see her again. If not, we might just back off a bit so that she can come down and have a drink. Yeah, I think she's behind that tree. I don't think she's come out yet. Herbert's just going to have a look. Okay. He's lying, she's lying down behind that tree. So I don't think she's going to come out again. I think what we'll do is either wait here and stay out of sight a little bit and see if she comes down, or we'll go on and see if we can't find that male lion. Lots of exciting things going on here. Right, we're going to have a little discussion here as to what to do, which cat to try and find. Let's go back to that beefy buffalo. Well, look at that. It has hardly moved, everybody. And very exciting with the leopard once again. But here we have a very big buffalo just chewing the cud like cows do. See how it's chewing there? And that's uh, just chewing the cud balls. See, they, they bite off some grass, they chew it and they swallow it, and then it gets regurgitated up again into their mouth. They chew it again and they'll swallow it again. And that, that, that can happen two or three times. But wow, look at all of that mud and look at all the flies around its face. Doesn't seem to worry too much about all those flies, eh? Hey? I would be a, very bothered by all of that. But uh, this buffalo looks quite comfortable. Serenity, they like being in the mud because they've got very thick skin, so they don't really feel too much. It's like, it's like on the heel of your foot, which has got lots of skin and it's very thick. And if you get an itch on your heel, it's very difficult to get that itch away, isn't it? You, it's, even if you scratch it, it doesn't really go away. So imagine feeling like that over your whole body. So what buffalo like to do is to go and lie in in the mud and it's nice and cool so it also uh, it makes them nice and cool but then afterwards they'll go and rub up against a tree or a rock and uh, that also helps to get rid of parasites like ticks and fleas but it also really feels good so I think they do it for a few different reasons now, this buffalo is really enjoying itself in the mud, and I think I'm going to leave him here because he looks quite comfortable. But you know what? David has got one of the tallest African mammals. Yes, the buffalo in the mud, and what uh, my good friend Ralph was explaining to you is how they regurgitate and they chew cud. We got other similar animals here that also chew cud or ruminate, and these are giraffes. Look at that, kids. We got one, two, three, four, and maybe a fifth one somewhere hiding in the bush. Yes, I agree, so many, and this is the thing, the largest herd I've seen. I mean, uh, in Kenya we see them in big groups. Kenya is a country north uh, in East Africa, where I come from, but I had seen one and two giraffes the other day, but today I am seeing five and I'm feeling so happy, just like you kids are, I guess. And I'm sure you know, this is the tallest animal in the whole world. See how majestic they are when they walk. Isabella, that's a very good question. I'll first ask you, Isabella, how tall you are yourself, and then I'll tell you how tall a giraffe is. I am 6'2 myself, and giraffe in general, the males are slightly bit taller than the females, and they are anything about 5.5 meters, which m that might translate into about, sorry, about, uh, I would say, 16, 17 feet, you'd imagine. 
15, 16 feet tall, eh? Tall animals, Isabella, eh? So you can imagine, eh? They would be better than the, basket, the basketball players if they would, you know, play basket, eh? So Isabella will be waiting to know how tall you are. And what we'll try and do now is to get close to them. We'll try and sneak very, very close to them. We see one of them, if you look carefully, there's one that is following the other one very closely and I think, I'm not very sure, the one in the front is a female and you can tell from where we are now, the one to the right of your screen is a little smaller in size than the other one on the left or the one behind it. And my good guess is the one in the front is a female with male in the back. And we'll be trying to sneak closer and a smaller animal, which is a predator with spot, James has it. We are still with this leopard, and listen carefully. You can hear the monkeys going crazy. They're going... It's because they're saying to each other, Leopard, watch out, there's a leopard. Watch out, everybody get up the tree. There's a leopard, watch out, watch out. Now we're sitting here in the shade and the leopard knows we're here, but she spotted something else in the bush. And we're just waiting here quietly, sitting, and by sitting, she won't be nearly as afraid of us as she will if we're standing up. Craig, who's on camera standing, otherwise we wouldn't be able to see her. Is she having a drink there, Craig? She's just started to have a drink. I'm going to stand. Oh, this is very special, everybody. We don't see this all the time. Isabella, a leopard can run much faster even than you. Now, I know that you are fast, but a leopard can run even faster than you. And you'll probably find that they can run, if they really try, at about 45 miles an hour. But not for long, for a very short time. You might also be able to hear something like a dog barking. It's a kudu going, a very angry kudu. Hmm. Well, Amir, this is very interesting. So you say, will the leopard chase the monkeys? They, she could, but she won't. Because what those monkeys are saying is, we can see you. And they want the leopard to hear that they have seen her. Because that means that she's much less likely to try and catch one. Also, the little monkeys are very good in the trees. Now, a leopard is quite good in the trees, but not nearly as good as a monkey. So the monkeys go and sit on the small branches at the top of the tree. And then they wait. Oh, she spotted something else. She's not worried about us at all now. She spotted something else there. There she goes. I think she'll probably go back to the kill that she had earlier. She's watching us now. She's just admiring Craig's t-shirt. Oh, she's precious. Isn't that wonderful? She's a big female leopard, that. And there she goes. So I don't think we're going to see her again. That's very, very special. Let's go back to those very tall giraffe of David. Right. That was great sighting. You know, we the leopard there having a drink and now we got the bigger animal we had before with even bigger spots the giraffe I was saying earlier that one of them was following the other very very closely and my good guess is the bigger one was the male and the smaller one was the female we have even got much closer to them than we were before and they beautiful kids they're just saying hello to you when they flip their ears they're saying hello to all of you 
all the way from South Africa. Very lucky animals because they are the only ones that are able to eat the very soft top leaves of most trees. Unless you're a monkey who could jump that high, but for all the other animals that are not able to jump, giraffe have that advantage of eating on top of most, if not all, the trees they like eating. And males will have like two horns and a little knob in front of those two horns, while the females will only have two. That's how maybe very quickly you can tell the difference between males and females. Initially, you remember we saw the impala and the impala told you the male had horns and the female did not have any horns. Sorry, Cassie. Kellen is asking, do giraffes do what? Kaylan, your question is, do giraffes live anywhere else other than South Africa? Yes, you'll see giraffes almost in most countries in Africa. There is a country called Kenya, as I said earlier, and Kenya is in East Africa. That's where I come from. We got giraffes there. We got giraffes in Tanzania, I think, and I know you know your geography very well. We got giraffes in so many other countries in Africa. I'm not sure whether you have them anywhere else in the world. You may have them in America, I believe, but most likely they are in a zoo and they were introduced there and possibly also from Africa. So we got giraffes and other places apart from South Africa. The main reason you'll only see them in Africa is because of the kind of food they eat and it's kind of the scrub bushes, like what you see that one eating, very good. And I guess it's eating a buffalo thorn. And this food or this type of vegetation, you may not see it growing in any other parts, maybe outside the tropics. So it's difficult to see this kind of vegetation in other parts of the world. Cecilia, you'd like to know how many babies a giraffe would have at a time. Number one, I would want first to tell you, giraffes got a very long gestation period. Gestation period is the time taken to bring or to give birth. And is almost 14 plus, 14 and a half months. In general, giraffes will have one baby after the 14 and a half months at a time but on very very rare occasions they have been known to get twins but Cecilia in general it's one baby at a time look at those beautiful patterns there eh? Isabella, you'd like to know why they have those patterns. I hope I you got your question correct. Yes, I mean, through evolution, you realize all animals have evolved and they look different from each other. But what should happen is this pattern when the giraffes hide in the bushes or when they think there's a concern of someone coming for them say a lion or a leopard and most a lion they are able to blend in and hide in the bushes sometimes when you see them standing next to a bush that is a bit dry and the leaves are a bit brownish you realize the giraffe or you realize the giraffe will blend in very nicely in that bush and that way it will protect and hide itself from the lions, for example. All right, Isabella?
I don't know how old Isabella you are, but you can walk through that giraffe. Am I a very good question? What should happen, Am I? Your question is, how can the giraffes hide from a giraffe when they are that tall? The giraffes are not very much worried by the leopards because the giraffes are like, whew, I would say 10 times, 20 times bigger than leopards and they do not cause them a concern. So whether a leopard will spot them or not, giraffes will know, rarely, rarely leopards will go for giraffes. But you, you're very right, they may not be able to hide from the, you know, from the leopards because leopards will spot them. But they know for a fact that leopards will not go to the giraffes. So it could be looking at something you never know and you see it's just staring in one direction and sometimes not always sometimes when you see them just positioned looking in one direction not twitching not moving their head there could be a possibility there's something that's not very very happy of or very comfortable with and in general those should be predators say either like lions or hyenas or even a leopard that's not go for it but still it may want to show that predator or that animal I can see you. And at the same time, he's looking at me. No, I think he's looking at VM. And James got something on the ground who is on a bushwalk. So, this is an ant carrying another dead ant. Why it's carrying a dead ant, I don't know, but you know, ants sometimes eat other ants. So maybe this ant is taking the dead ant back to his nest to share it with all of his many, many friends. <gasps> he's left it behind. Maybe he's lost direction. Now, our leopard friend has gone off into the bush, but Ralph's coming back in the car to see if he can't find the leopard again for you. What's going on here? This is a special ant called Polyrachis. And I don't know why Polyrachis is carrying those other ants but to eat them. So maybe Polyrachis is going back to the home to see if she can feed these other ants to her friends and there'll be thousands and thousands of her friends in the colony. But she now looks a bit lost, doesn't she? She's going away again. She's coming towards me. Hmm. All right, so now while she's there, hiding, let's have a look at what she was carrying. We'll put it back there in case she comes back for it. Yeah. That's a whole lot. A whole lot of ants. It's a whole lot of ant. It's two. It's two of them. It's two ants. There we are. They're both dead. And I wonder what she was going to do with them. Hmm. Lily, I don't think salt is bad for ants. All creatures will need a certain amount of salt even if it's just a little bit. So no, salt is not necessarily bad for them. Are you thinking of snails, perhaps, Lily? Salt's quite bad for snails. If you put salt on a snail, it will die. So please don't put any salt on a snail if you see one. All right, so that's the ant polyrachis. We've had some information telling us that the lion tracks are the other side of that waterhole. So we'll probably walk down through the bush here and see if we can't find them that side. Here we're going down into a nice, beautiful, dry riverbed. <laughs> well, Lily, it's because the weather is not always hot here. Although it's hot now, it's not always hot. It does get quite cold here. Even though it's warm, we have to wear clothes. 
And when it gets a little bit colder than we wear a jersey, like in a few layers, and so the animals, although it's quite hot to have fur, they don't want to be too cold when it's a little bit cold, and so they have thin fur. They don't have fur like a bear has fur. A bear is able to get through some very dark, dark times, or very uh, cold times, as do creatures like moose or deer. They've got much longer hair than the animals out here. All righty, we've got Ralph. He's found the monkeys and he's found Shiguru, the leopard. Now look at this, everyone. You see how these monkeys, they're telling everybody that there's a leopard here. And they're making a very big racket. But that's one of the alarm signals that you listen out for in the bush. If you're trying to find a lion or a, or a leopard, the monkeys and they'll tell you where they are. If you ever try and sneak up on a monkey, it's almost impossible. They're so alert, they'll see you coming from a mile away. That if you can hear them there, you see. And we're just here near to Shutulu, the leopard. Mm -hmm. Now, Alia, I can't exactly speak monkey, but uh, I do know that um, that call, that cow cow, cow cow, cow cow, that's an alarm call. So when they make that noise, that's because there's a predator, whether it's a lion or a leopard, sometimes even an eagle, and they'll also make that call, and other times for snakes as well. So they make that noise as an alarm, but you can hear them now just in the background there. They're all telling everybody that there's a leopard nearby and they must all be careful. Elias, well, a leopard can hear very well too. So she'll be hearing these monkeys and she won't be very happy that uh, they're telling everybody that she's here. But, well, luckily for her, she had a nice meal this morning. She ate lots of that impala. So she's got quite a fat belly and that's why she would have come for a, a little drink. And now she's just relaxing in the shade, just trying to cool off. And she might go back to where that the, the rest of that impala is, but she needs to be quick because the vultures are all coming down now and they're going to start eating that, that uh, uh, skeleton that's left there. And maybe tonight there'll be some hyenas as well. So she needs to go back or she'll just have to leave it and they can finish it off. Maybe she's had enough. I'm not quite sure. We'll have to see when she gets up if she goes back towards the impala or if she just continues on her way. But at the moment she's not protecting it so anybody can feed on that meat that's left there at the moment. But you see how she's panting. Very often after they eat they pant like that. Now, Liam, uh, the leopard it will be hearing, smelling and seeing the impala when they're in the dark and they can see very well at night but they've also got a very good sense of smell and hearing, very good ears, eyes and nose. So they'll be watching those impala in the dark and then they'll lie behind and as the, the tree and as the impala walks past they'll jump out and grab it. But uh, that's when the monkeys are all sleeping as well at night. Monkeys sleep at night, so they don't, uh, they don't alarm call during the night. And so the, the leopard can move around easier. And that's when it's better for it to hunt. Very pretty cat this is, hey? Shudulu. Shudulu means termite mound. Because she likes going and lying on the top of termite mounds and then looking out and looking for impala and anything else that might come past. And lots of panting. She's got lots of food to digest in her stomach, so it's a lot of hard work. So it's been a very nice uh, afternoon with all the school kids and I want to say thank you from our side for joining us here in the Juma Concession in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa and we hope that you join us again. But for now it's goodbye from me and the rest of the team here in South Africa. Bye kids. What
Hello everyone and a very good afternoon from all of us here in South Africa. My name is David and on the camera this afternoon with me is VM. Yes, that's the gentleman who will be doing all the filming work for us today and a very warm welcome and hopefully you'll be with us for the sunset drive. Temperatures were well, about 28 degrees centigrade and 82 degrees Fahrenheit much better than this morning much warmer for me especially coming from kenya and what a lovely day we have today please remember to ask us questions and give us your feelings and comments on twitter hashtag safari live and you can follow us on the youtube stream i'm sure you may be knowing we got two other gentlemen with me today out there we got a gentleman by the name of james henry doing his zigzag walking in the bush and we also got rough casting also working with me to get all these animals today this morning we were so lucky for those who are with us in the morning to have sighted a pack of wild dogs the excitement that i had in me i had in the morning is still with me and my plans are just to head in the same direction and find out if they are still there and what could be happening Right, stay with us, stay on board until the end of the drive. All right. All right. And that's very good news. And remember what I told Hello is from the country come from Kenya. And Hello was or Hello is Jumbo, Jumbo, Jumbo. Later on, we might be learning one or two more words in Swahili. But let's first get a bit of uh, animals moving out here and there. We might be having a beautiful bar there, VM, to set the show. And as warm you up with Jumbo, Raf got, um, Merafik Raf got something that has spots. <laughs> yes, lots of spots and rosettes, all sorts. Um, but I, I think I'm thinking of sitting a little bit while longer here with uh, Shudulu. And then I'm interested in going back to the carcass uh, of that impala because it seems the uh, vultures have returned and there's quite a few of them on the ground I saw as I drove past. So it might be quite interesting to go and watch that uh, unfold with the scavengers now moving in because she's not looking like she's going to be doing much in the next little while and uh, well for something different just to go and watch what happens around there at the carcass could be quite interesting you see very heavily panting now at the moment it is quite warm and she's got a reasonably full belly so lots of work to digest all that meat and to keep cool at the same time it's all happening It is quite hot. But she is such a beautiful cat. I have to say, I really enjoy watching her. Not that I don't enjoy any of the other leopards, but uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's quite special. Now, so Mug, um, yes, in general, I would say that leopards and their success rate is better than lions. Um, if if you look at uh, different animals, and I mean, obviously, this is in general, and it's it's uh, it's not conclusive as well. But they say lions lions have generally about a sixty percent success rate, um, so it's not actually that good. Um, whereas uh, when you go to leopards, you're looking at about a 70-75% success rate. Cheetah, even better than that, at about 80% success rate. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, the hyenas and the wild dogs being the top of the pile. When hyenas um, decide that they're going to hunt, they generally do land up catching what they started out with. And the same with wild dogs. The wild dogs being the best, uh, probably followed by hyena and then leopard and cheetah, uh, those two close together. And then of the, of the apex predators, the lions are probably the worst. Um, 
but that's uh, yeah, it's uh, debatable, and obviously different areas uh, the predators will have different success rates, etc. But uh, here in this particular area, I would say that the leopards are one of the most successful. Definitely wild dogs. When they decide to go, they generally come out uh, with something to eat. So it's all very interesting. That's just one of our game viewers just moving out again. It was Rex who was with us this morning as well. And they're just bundu bashing their way out of here. Because we, we're just in a little area next to Galago Pan, which is actually behind the Juma Lodge itself. So, and the monkeys are still calling. And Shadulu is just trying to cool off, it seems. Yeah, but wonderful day it has been today with sitting with Shudulu. Uh, Eric, yeah, this this thing about dewlaps and leopards, um, it's still not sure as to, you know, what the point of it is or, you know, what's the reason behind it. But uh, I do think that it definitely uh, serves a protective purpose, you know, very uh, loose skin around the neck. You know, and I often look at um, my basset hound as an example. He's got so much loose skin around the neck, and he got attacked by one dog um, just recently. And the dog went for his neck, um, and it was a Staffordshire Terrier. But it went for the neck, and if he had tight skin around that neck, he would have killed him. But he literally shook and shake him. He sh uh, shook and shake him. He shook him <laughs> terribly around the neck area, um, and... Well, he landed up having obviously puncture wounds and so on, because, but because the skin was so loose, um, it landed up that uh, he just had a lot of puncture wounds and some, some tears, but he didn't get to the internal organs and it didn't rip open either. So I think that loose skin um, definitely helps, especially if you're going to be getting in a fight with another male leopard. Uh, so yeah. Absolutely, I think it's guaranteed that it would help, but whether or not that's the real purpose behind it um, is not quite sure. I would say it's a definite advantage to have a dewlap if you're going to be fighting with other male leopards. So that one of Tingana's, I think, is very good that he's got it if he lands up in a big fight with Hukumuri, for instance. It would definitely help him around that neck area if Hukumuri got him there. Um, but then obviously in the reverse as well, so it sort of levels the score. Okay, I'm going to reposition shortly and just see if Shudulu actually gets up, possibly moves back towards the carcass. If she doesn't, I'm going to go there. But in the meantime, off to James on foot. <laughs> Craig is just doing a pirouette around me. Very good, Craig. It's a lovely pirouette that you did there. Uh, everybody... Welcome to the adult version of the bushwalk. I always say that, regular version of the bushwalk. We have here a bush to introduce ourselves. It is Pyrostria hystrix, or the porcupine bush. Very good. Shudulu is still exactly where she went to sleep after seeing us at the pan. And we're now hopefully on the trail of a male, male lion. Uh, the most garbled kind of reports that he was around here, we did hear the monkeys shouting long before Shudulu came down here, and also the same kudu going, Khaw, 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 khaw. I think that's quite a good kudu impression. Khaw. It's exactly what it sounds like, Kirsten. Yes, exactly. And so now we're seeing if we can find uh, some tracks. Kirsten does not agree that <coughs> is a good impression of a kudu bark. That's because her voice hasn't broken, and she's jealous that she can't do that. Sorry for you. And so what we've done is we've done a big circle around <laughs> Tandi, and uh, not Tandi, she do, and we're going to see if we can find some more tracks along this very gorgeous drainage system here. All of you reminding me that I said I would sing the Gummy Bears theme tune uh, as it got dark today. Well, I said I will do it, and so shall I do it. All you need to do, Kirsten, is remind me in my last segment, and I shall sing the Gummy Bears theme tune in the words that I can remember anyway. Here's a male version of 
the tropical tenterweb spider. Now, I don't know how many of you were with us about three weeks ago on Sunday afternoon when I told you about the breeding of all these spiders. I think it's specifically the orb webs, but it may apply to just about all spiders. But they have a specific lock and key mechanism for the delivery of sperm from the male to the female, and he does it with his petty pulps. And his petty pulps, only the right species of spiders' petty pulps will fit into the receiving organs of the female. So in other words, another species of spider couldn't come along here and try and sort of mate with this female because it just simply mechanically wouldn't work. So it's a lock and key mechanism. Uh, peop- you know, I, when I first read that, I thought that's quite surprising, but actually, it's not very surprising. Um, I don't think it, you know, I think it works like that pretty much with, with most species of animals, uh, but maybe it's a little bit more sophisticated with the spider. But what was most interesting is that to get the sperm onto his petty pulps, he has to spin a little web, make a deposit of sperm inside that little web, and then dip his petty pulps into it. And the description I read in the book, and it's a wonderful one, in the same way that you would dip an old fountain pen into the inkwell, so this is what the spider does with his petty pulps into his little sperm sack. And then he carries them off to the female and delivers his load and quite often gets eaten in the process. And uh, while we talk about being eaten in the process of that, of course, the most famous example of spousal eating, other than the human being, of course, ha 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 ha, that's just a small joke, is the praying mantis. And interestingly enough, the neural mechanism by which a praying mantis mates with the female is not located in his head. So when she turns around and bites his head off, he keeps mating, which is absolutely astounding. And apparently, mantises that have had their heads bitten off are more effective at delivering sperm to the female than those who escape the ordeal in one piece. Nature ain't half strange. Come on, Craig. Let's continue. You can go around that way. I've stunned you all silent with that uh, fact, I see. <laughs> and yet again, I'm being put to shame, apparently, by David Githu Githamba, who has found another animal. Well, James is so good when he goes out on a walk, he'll see the big things. But he discusses more the small things than the big things, which to me is quite exciting as I've been learning some good stuff from him. And we are on this particular boundary here, on the eastern boundary, uh, called the Gary Cut Line. And my destination, as I said earlier, I want to get to the place or to my favorite spot where I saw the wild dogs this morning because that was. I would say an epic sighting for me. They did not do much, but I had them for about two hours plus. That was something. Because in general, wild dogs are always on the move. You see them here the next one minute. They could be like one kilometer away. They walk very, very, very quickly. And it was so exciting this morning when we just sat with them there. We had a few uh, animals that came around the waterhole, like the impalas, waterbucks, nyalas, and they did not make a move to either of them. They looked to me very, very full. The bellies were bulging. And one thing I would also like to see, possibly, possibly, is to see them going for a hunt. The very successful hunters, the very, very efficient, very good planning, and the strategy they lay, it's so, so, so good. And if you'd consider or compare the wild dogs with the other predators, like lions or leopards or cheetahs, I would say they top, for me, they're on that high ranking of success. They're very successful. The moment they set their eyes on something, chances are they'll always get it. Unlike the lions, whose success is very, very low, I've always respected the wild dogs for their planning, and when they execute it, they'll be very patient. They'll not just go without proper planning, but once they do it, chances are they'll always get someone for they'll always get someone for dinner or for lunch.
and Shilulu is still with my Rafik Raf. Yes, well, maybe we should say that I'm still with her because I think she's more royal than I am. What do you think? Hey? I'm definitely. Look at that. Lovely. And she at least sits up and acknowledges, and acknowledges our presence. I just had a little bit of an itch there. Uh, Shadulu, are you going to go back and eat some more of your impala, or are you just going to let the vultures and hyenas rip it to pieces? Have you had enough? Uh, Romit, there's, there, there is, uh, I wouldn't say major differences, but there are your noticeable dis differences between the different uh, cats uh, in terms of their bone structures. Um, obviously, because they're all adapted to their different habitats and environments. So, for instance, like the, um, like with the cheetah, um, really adapted to that real speed type, um, uh, adaptation and, and the body structure so much longer legs than for instance with the leopard and then then you go down to like a caracal where they've got a lot lot very short legs but very stocky body so you've got the lankiness of of a cheetah moving right down to that real stockiness of a caracal or, or a lynx so from reasonably thin bones in the cheetah built for speed to right down to that stocky nature of the lynx built for power and i would say that the leopard's probably um a lot closer to the lynx but with a slight inkling towards the cheetah uh, just with a bit of speed but uh, still very much a powerful creature and then the lion also a lot of power there so very thick bones um but yeah we've uh, i would say those the cheetahs may be a little bit of the exception a little bit away from the rest where it has uh, got quite thin bones and designed totally for speed and being lightweight whereas a lot of the other cats are are more for power and built for ambush so the bone structure all evident in in the different habitats that the cats uh, find themselves in and have adapted to but not massive differences i would say uh, overall because uh, they've got the same body shape um, and just the, the difference in in leg height and then in thickness of bone really but uh, otherwise very similar in terms of the entire structure uh, very good question that Romit. nice one Thanks again for your questions. You're always putting through good ones. It's uh, sometimes challenging, but that's good. We like a bit of a challenge. So I'm wondering, do we go back to the carcass? Do we stay here? It's always a gamble. We leave here. And there's nothing happening at the carcass, and we come back here, and Shudulu's gone. But, well, we might just have to take that gamble. Now, Matt, um, Shudulu did put that impala up in a tree, but uh, it was later in the morning that it actually, uh, she was busy trying to feed on it um, and moving it around a little bit in the tree, and eventually it fell out. So, and then she went down, and it looked like she was going to take it back up the tree, but then I think she just almost didn't feel like it she just looked like she lost uh, interest in actually taking it back up and so then she just lay down next to it on the ground um so yes it initially was up in the tree it's fallen down and she hasn't bothered to take it back up that's the only reason those vultures now are having a go and i think with the way that she's looking now i'm going to head back that way and we can just watch the vultures before there's nothing left I think because there were one or two getting in there when I last saw, so I'm pretty sure by now there's going to be quite a few of them you know, all fighting over the scraps. And so by the time Shadulu goes back, there actually might be nothing left anyway. So she might have resigned herself to that fact already, and uh, she might just move on from here without even going back. Oh. 
just look here, it's just off to our left, Davy. I don't know if you, if you, ooh, if you don't move too much. There was a little chin spot battus. There he is, there he is. Look at that. There's a pair of them right on top. There he is, chin spot battus. Now, that's a female. The male has got the little chin spot, if I'm not mistaken. That is awesome. On a little spike thorn there, and I've just zooted off. That was very, very cool. It's a very little, uh, like a couple doing their little call between each other. But um, it seems James has found some other antelope, and uh, that's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it's fascinating. It's absolutely gobsmackingly amazing. We have found a herd of impala right where we expected to find the lion tracks. I suspect the lion track we've been sent on is such a goose chase of wild proportions that uh, there is no evidence of any lion around here whatsoever. So I don't know what's going on here. Herbert is now shouting at somebody on the radio who gave him rubbish information, and so he's now having a thorough haranguing, which is precisely what should happen. There are impala all over this place. Shudulu's not far away, she's just down here with Ralphie. And the impala look, as they say, in a cool lingo, cool lingo, you don't think you even say that anymore, uh, they look chilled to the max. Mm -hmm. Craig's looking embarrassed by me right now. I'm sorry about that, Craig. Yeah, Kirsten says she doesn't think they use that anymore. <laughs> what do you think, Craig? <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. You say you're happy I found heartbeats. Reminds me, of course, that um, if I ever meet our Dive Live crew, uh, of course, we have a Patrick in that crew and he's a well he's a little bit like the young chaps we have here uh, he speaks in a, in a manner that is uh, cool uh, it is uh, sophist not sophisticated at all it is um he doesn't say chilled to the max as kirsten says yes he probably says something else what would he say craig craig says he doesn't know he hasn't spoken to him i suppose that's a fairly good answer yeah oh well let's carry on we're going to go and see if we can't find uh, these tracks. They seem to be now further up towards the uh, the northern boundary. So we'll totter up there and see if we can find see if we can find some more interesting small things on the way. You can go that way, Craig, and that way it'll look like I'm walking through the bushes. You see? Yes, very good. Hmm. See, I'm extremely artistic, Craig. Craig doesn't like to talk much when he's at work. <laughs> Craig doesn't like to talk much. <laughs> anyway, I'll try and find something of biological usefulness now. Come on, Craig, let's find something useful. Let's pick a plant and see what's in it. Cheeky <laughs> Begeeky Beth, you say something about the 80s and uh, my language being more relevant there. Well, I think you're probably absolutely right. There's a spider here, old buddy, old pal. It's another tropical tent web spider. There it is. I'm going to fall off this log, aren't I? It's threatening to break under my enormous mass. Unfortunately, I can't tell you anything I haven't told you already about the tropical tent web spider. Safe to say that I think they do live longer than a season. Can anyone help me out on that? Because I think that we find them throughout the winter. Because, of course, most spiders do not make it through a season. Most of them will pop off, like the golden orb webs, and not make it through the season. So if anyone can tell me that, that would be great. Ooh, I found something else. Isn't this amazing? There's a reptile egg over here. Come and have a look here, Craig. It was not on my nose, the reptile egg. It's down here. It's that small white thing there. Is it a reptile egg? Or is it a bit of fungus? Hang on, I have to put my hand in there. No, it's a bit of fungus. It's not a reptile egg. But it is where you'd expect to find a reptile egg. So it's a bit of fungus, 
growing out of the uh, root of the tree. And of course, as we know, the mycelia of fungus provide a sort of internet for the trees. And there's more and more research being done on this showing how the trees uh, talk with each other using this internet and actually harness carbon for each other and not only within their species but interspecifically which I think is absolutely astounding. There is an impala alarm calling over there. David has another one. Right from Impalas calling to impalas almost going for each other. These two males here were sharpening their horns, they were strengthening their necks in the bushes you see around there, and were just about to go for each other. One of them has chickened out, and they're following each other like, you know, let's go for each other. And you see, they're like, you move over, you come over, you try, you move. L look at that. The rotting season is on now after we saw the first full moon and it will continue until the next full moon. But one of them is chickening out. They've been fighting the bushes around here for the last 3-5 minutes, trying to strengthen their neck muscles. And the two of them to me look to be in very good shape. I do not know who would be the winner here if they decide to go for each other. Come on, Ipalas, give us a little show, eh? To me, both of them look very, very prime, and it could be very difficult to judge. Looking at the impala we saw earlier, we had all these theories of what could have killed it, and at one point, James thought maybe when it was trying to strengthen its neck muscles, it might have hit, you know, a little tree trunk very hard, and it, you know, broke its skull and it bled to death, or it had some, you know, internal uh, bleeding in the head and it died. That would happen once in a while because he wasn't able to see any marks, any teething or any claw marks on it. Now that would happen once in a while and if these two guys decide to go for each other, would be able to explain why some of them maybe would die without having been brought down by a predator. Now this is the one to me that looks very very prime to start the fight. And one is just chickened out and just moving to the left. You see that one VM on the left? Very good there. Now, that one could be a bit of scent marking, unlike trying to strengthen its neck or sharpening its horns. And looking at the other one and wondering, do we go for each other or don't we do it? Well, that one is like, well, we can fight another day. Maybe not today. Yeah, he's going away and he has to justify if he has to get any females he has to justify why he gets them by becoming a good fighter you know and by looking good and the females have to be convinced why he has to keep them if not boom we're not very very far from the water hole where i saw my wild dog this morning and we want to head out there and see if Wallach is still holding and if not we'll know what to do let's get there now and And you can hear them snorting. Now it's the time to say we're gonna go for each other. And let's just see that. Listen to that. Okay, it's full combat. And the other one is coming. Now let's see. Just listen. Hang on, casting. Oops. That's like a war cry to me. Excellent, excellent Cassie. Listen. Okay, the other one's coming close now. It's coming, closing in. And the one that had the loudest war cry seems to be chickening, in, chickening out again. That would happen once in a while. This one just came back. And let's see, do we ruminate? Do we cheer the cat? Do we go for each other? Do we stay as friends? I'm not sure, they're not decided yet. I 
I thought they had drawn the battle lines, but again, there's a change of plan here. Either they'll choose a different area to go for each other, but let's go back to my original plan of finding out the wild dogs are there. Have some feathered friends up some in the air or on a tree. Well, have a look at this. These are not the prettiest of birds that you've ever seen, but these hooded vultures are oh, they've been having a little go at the at the carcass down on the ground. There's two of them here, and I think that all the white-backed vultures have disappeared off to that other impala that was uh, pretty much whole. And so these hooded vultures, which are quite a lot smaller than the white-backed vultures, have uh, stayed behind because they can now have a go at this impala that doesn't have as much meat on it, but there is still quite a bit of meat there. Minamu, the real adaptations from leopards to be able to, you know, pick up the uh, um, food and take it up a tree, it, I would say is that real, uh, it's almost like a vehicle, it's a power to gear ratio, because they've got a very strong jaw, they've got a very strong neck and front quarters, and then, um, and then they've also got the skill and agility to be able to move around in the tree, because lions can get up trees, um, but they're just not very skilled or very um, adept at getting down the trees. So they can often have accidents, and there's been a lot of lions actually hung in the tree when they've trying when they're trying to get down. But remember, in the Maasai Mara, um, we have seen a lot of tree climbing uh, lions there, uh, mostly up the shepherd trees, those kind of boskia albitrancas, um, but you know, these big kind of trees like this, their weight, it, it just puts them at a disadvantage. The leopard is just the perfect size to muscle ratio, and that it's able to really grab the meat and put it between its front legs and lift the neck, as well as grabbing with those very strong, powerful front legs and pull itself up. Um, it's just a very special adaptation with the leopards. There's, um, uh, there's nothing that uh, really stops the other cats from doing that. It's just that they're not exactly perfectly aligned for going up trees, which, uh, which leopard are. It's kind of like the speed at which cheetah can run. There's also that very special adaptations and just uh, thinner bones, less weight, uh, perfectly designed for running at, to uh, at very high speeds. So it's just that slight evolutionary uh, fork where they've uh, uh, they've decided to take their kills up trees to avoid the other predators, and while well, they've gotten very good at it now. And you see with these vultures, they don't have any feathers on the head. That's because they'll be sticking their heads right inside a carcass. Uh, Florida, we'll get um, definitely in Juma, we'll get uh, the ones that we see quite regularly, the most common being the white-backed vulture, and then you'll have the leopard-faced vulture, which are the real classic, uh, very pink-faced, ugly um, vultures. They, they're probably the largest of the lot, and then the smallest being here, this uh, little hooded vulture and i'm not sure i don't know if we got the cape vulture that traditionally would have been up this far i'm just going to check in my book um they are pretty much uh, uh, almost extinct the cape vultures there's a few small pockets of them of them around um so and kirsten's saying that uh, they, they might have seen one on the show but very rare so that's where i'm thinking they should naturally occur here um but uh, with them being almost extinct, I was wondering if they if they had any here. But let's let's just have a check in my little book. I'll check all the distributions. Oh, we're seeing that lovely landscape there. So we've got the African white-backed vulture. Um, 
the cape vulture yes traditionally it should actually occur here and i'm going to put it up here sorry about the shadow the cape or the griffin vulture okay with its distribution over there now that's southern africa where you can see south africa just up and where the border of south africa hits mozambique that's where we are here so yes it should definitely occur here um I've seen them on the east coast around Umkambati, but they are very rare. Um, what does it say? Frequent high cliffs, colonies. So probably closer. They would probably be nesting in the sort of Drakensberg area. Um, I also get the Rupels, but that that one I don't think occurs here at all. So it's that one, that one. Then the lappet faced vulture, like I said, um, very ugly in terms of his face, and over there, uh, very very ugly looking. Well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Some some people think they're very pretty. Um, we also get the white headed and the hooded. So that's what we're seeing here, the hooded. And we might get a white headed as well. Um, we don't get the palm nut vulture or the Egyptian vulture or the bearded vulture or the Lamachai. So the palm nut we get in we do get in um, Kenya. Oh, very exciting. We've gone from these vultures now who's starting to have a little bit of a feed there. Uh, it seems David has found his subject for the day. Yes, everyone, and as promised earlier, and our luck has held together, we spoke of wild dogs or our painted dogs or painted wolves. We saw them here early this morning, and they have been stuck here since early the time we came here, and they are still here. Very, very special sighting for me. Sorry, that was just a hip that sneezed and, you know, scared that one particular wild dog there and what a sighting again for me and how lucky to have this very special sighting for the second time in one day and I said early in the morning they look very very full and their bellies are huge and good to hear that all of you are excited remember I'm equally excited with you and this is as I said early in the morning is quite epic Wild dogs move, they are always on the move, they are always on the run. They'll never give you more than 45 seconds of a shot to take and you never frame, before you frame them, they are gone. But this morning they were here for about two hours plus and I will sit with them here for quite some time. Look at those rounded ears, eh? So that one is looking Exactly, I agree. They're like Mickey Mouse, and uh, yeah, you're right, Casty. And ears to the wild dogs are very, very important. And if you look carefully in that one, VMC, how close you can frame in that one particular ear, you will notice the ears of wild dogs got very, very many muscles in them. And they will need the muscles because they will need to turn those ears, you know, left, right, up, down, just like you know. Uh, satellite dish on a radar there because they need to pick any any small any minutest sound that may be out there in the bush because that's how they hunt and or that's how they get their food so any slight sound any slight call they'll pick them with their ears listen to that That is not the wild dogs, neither is it VM, neither is it David. Those are the hippos. Could be that guy there. And what a wonderful wild we have, and what a wonderful sighting we have. One side hippos, mind your business. The other side, the very, very rare sightings of wild dogs. And everybody looks at home and at peace with each other. How exciting is that? It's 
Sinak, you'd like to know how much do wild dogs sleep in a day? Hmm, do I know the answer for that? I wouldn't be able to tell you certainly like with the lions which we have an idea of how much they sleep in a day but how i may want to get to an answer for you sinak wild dogs are very diano animals they're very diano predators more often than not they're dogs that are active during the day and at night unless there's some bright moonlight at night they slow down they just behave like cheetahs and they're more active during the day I would guess, but this is just a sheer guess. If you were here early in the morning, I do not know how many minutes they were sleeping, how many minutes they had their eyes closed, but I would say that could be a difficult question, Sinak, for me to answer you. But I'll find out, and maybe tomorrow morning I'll be able to give you an answer. But during the day, these dogs are always on the move and very busy. But today, for one reason or another, they have struck sleeping because they are very, very full. Bobby, your question is, are the paws same size or similar size, you know, to the domestic dogs? I would say yes. I mean, they got the four toes without the dew toe with them. I would say more or less they're the same size with the, do you know, the domestic dogs. But you, you also realize we got different, you know, breeds of dogs. Some are huge, you know, like the German shepherd ones. But I would say the local dogs we have here in the village they come from, if you see a truck, of a wild dog and you put a truck of a domestic dog they are very very similar the hippos can't allow these dogs to sleep eh? so it's either the dogs shift their base and go and look for another place to have a nap or try and accommodate the hippos and they just enjoy the snooze very social dogs among all the dogs we got in Africa. I mean, they're like what you'd call the wolves in Europe or the coyotes or the foxes or the jackals could be their, you know, distantly related cousins here in Africa. And quite endangered now. I mean, we think we have about 5,000 to 10,000 wild dogs left in Africa. And the biggest threat or the biggest concern is man. A very close cousin to the wild dogs you got here is the Ethiopian wolf. Is the Ethiopian wolf, which that one, if you look at the IUCN status, it's more endangered than the wild dogs here. And again, the Ethiopian wolf or the Ethiopian wolves, they're facing the same challenges like the wild dogs in this part of uh, in this part of Africa. I've been doing comparisons of the animals that we find here in South Africa and the animals we see in East Africa, and I'm talking so of Kenya. In Kenya also, we got the we got wild dogs too, and one of the largest pack I saw sometimes back was about 65. The count this morning here of these wild dogs was eight, was eight, and I've seen seven now. Uh, we are still to get the eighth one and all of them will be accounted for. And how exciting to keep viewing these dogs again for the second time in one day. And my Rafiki James is bumbling somewhere in the bush. bumbling somewhere in the bush. We've had more garbled reports of where this male line is. We think we're on the right road. We're looking for tracks from the vehicle from this morning going off the road. But so far there are no tracks where everyone said they should be. 
So I still feel like we're on a slightly wild goose chase. That whole whispering thing that I did for the school kids earlier today sounds a bit ridiculous now to me, because we were obviously nowhere near where they saw that line earlier. But here also there don't seem to be any tracks, so I don't know what kind of a wild goose chase we're on. But Herbert has told us to stay close because this lion growled at them yesterday. Normally they just get up and move. Now, of course, we have had the uh, evokers on foot before, and we had two of them the other day, and I think it's probably the other two, not this one. I think this one, who is a bit bigger than the others and tends to spend more time on his own, is probably just a little less forgiving of our presence on foot. I'm not sure why that should be the case. He's probably also feeling very threatened by the fact that he's been chased about, I think, by the Birmingham boys. And so that will amplify his response to any threat. But we are way further along this road than we were told we should be. Anyway, so it goes. We've had a beautiful walk anyway. We've seen one cat on foot. It'd be quite nice to see two, though, wouldn't I know that's probably... Impala, when they were just having a rut, they're not alarming. All right, we'll have one last look around here and then move on to another area. Let's go back to the wild dogs with David. Yes, keep looking around here. Me, I got nothing to look for at the moment because I got this very great sighting here of wild dogs and just a few minutes ago I have been able to account for all of them and we got a total of eight we got a total of eight and this is what was there in the morning so all of them are accounted for Gemma, how are you? And your question is, do wild dogs have a matriarch? Yes, they do have. You see, in a pack of wild dogs, there will be what we'll call the breeding pair or the dominant pair, which of course will be a male and a female, and those two will be in charge. The male will be in charge and the female will be in charge. And unlike many other social animals, where you see when the females are born, they tend to remain either in the group, in the herd, or in the park, for example, in Pride of Lions. When you come to the wild dogs, the females tend to leave the park, and it's only the males that stay in. So you'll have the female, the matriarch for this case, meeting with a male that's not related to it. And of course, that helps to you know, take care of inbreeding. So yes, Gemma, uh, wild dogs got a uh, matriarch. And of course, I would say they also got a patriarch. Occasionally, you might get another pair that we call a beta pair, B-E-T-A, which are a little junior, comparing them to the breeding or to the dominant pair, which once in a while may also mate and get pups, but more often than not, those pups will be killed by the breeding pair or they'll be adopted by other females elsewhere. I hope that helps answer your question, Gemma. What a view, eh? Ravinda, you'd like to know if wild dogs have very sharp, shark like teeth. Yes, they do. Yes, Ravinda, they do. And knowing that wild dogs are carnivores and they will need to tear or shear their meat very, very quickly. You see wild dogs, how they hunt, and once they bring down or when they take down their prey, they have to eat it very, very quickly. One of their concerns or threats they have out there are either hyenas or lions. So I would say they've got very special molar teeth to be able, of course, to break bones, but more so the canachios they got 
are very very sharp they have to cut and sneer and shear meat very very quickly yes Ravina they got sharp teeth you rear notice as much as she's having a nap there the ears still keep moving just to pick any sound there and one of them just rose up to find out what could be happening and we got my Rafiki Raf with another predator. And well, we decided to come back and have a look if Shudulu had moved. And I think the only thing she's moved is her head, which has plumped back down on the ground, closed her eyes, and at least she's not panting as fast as she was a little bit earlier. I think the temperature has dropped a little bit. It is nice and cool well getting cool getting cooler and well at least she looks a bit more comfortable but she is in la la land at the moment the dreams are flowing there a pretty cat eh let's to see the rosettes from this angle and while those hooded vultures are still going on still picking away at that little a uh, bit of meat that's left on the carcass. Uh, look at that detail in the fur. Very pretty. Beautiful young female leopard. Looks so soft, doesn't it? I think she'll make a wonderful mother. It waits to be seen when that is going to happen. Very exciting. That's some excellent camera work there, Darby. That looks awesome. Beautiful. You see, she's got quite a big nick out of that ear there. Uh, um, the grass irritating the tips of her ear. That's one thing a cat cannot stand, and that's anything near the ears. I met a couple of little cats as pets myself, and that was one thing that they would never tolerate, is anything near to the ear or in the ear. Not so much like dogs. They, they also don't like it, but they're not quite as aggressive as the cats in getting rid of whatever is near or in the ear. Yep. And that sun's starting to head towards the horizon. So I wonder what the night is going to bring. Well, there's no real for animals. But um, for instance, with predator, predators, they have a very high heart rate because of their high metabolism, enabling them to be able to digest that real heavy meat protein. So for for leopard and lion um, and any of the other predators, it is I think they're more comfortable when it's a bit cooler. So the winter months, I think they they actually enjoy a lot more than the summer months when it's very hot. And obviously they can be exhausted and uh, it's quite extreme for them. And hence the reason why lions are literally exhausted, even without doing anything in the heat of the day. And they can actually get themselves into trouble. If it's very hot and they exert themselves in the heat, um, they can very quickly over exert themselves and, and actually even get close to death. Some of them can die through uh, exhaustion. But here you can see now, and it was a little bit earlier when she was panting quite fast, and it was probably because of the heat as well as having a full belly and having a drink. So a lot of digesting going on, which would heat her up anyway, and added to the fact that it was quite warm, it does then become quite... Um, tricky for them, you know, they need to sit and pant a lot because they can't, they don't sweat normally like we do. They, uh, they need to get that air flowing over their tongue and that is where their real radiator is. And so that's why you see a lot of water dribbling out of their mouth um, when it's really hot as well. 
but she seems quite comfortable now. So this autumn time of year is also very nice, both for humans. Us, I find it very comfortable. It's uh, it's uh, it's quite nice when you can actually pull your blanket over you at night. Um, there is, it's just cool enough for that because in summer you just lie in your bed and on top of your sheets and just sweat. Um, and you wake up with a wet pillow. Uh, and that's uh, as such a, is the weather here in the low felt. Um, it's normally, you know, quite hot and very humid and it's very sticky or close, as they would say in Scotland. But uh, at the moment, the humidity isn't there and it's rather, it's, it's just a, the perfect temperature, not too hot, not too cold. But when we hit, as soon as that sun goes down, we can feel that winter's on its way because there's just that bite in the air. And, uh, well, I know that it doesn't actually get that cold here, but uh, comparatively speaking, it, uh, or relatively, it, it does get quite chilly. It gets to about 8 or 9 degrees centigrade. 30s, I uh, think, 30s or maybe lower, 40, no, it's probably in the 30s, and um, so quite chilly in comparison, especially by the afternoon, then it can be 25 degrees Celsius, or, um, you know, in that sort of 60s, and so there's a big boost in winter, whereas in summer, it's just, it's just hot all the time, so, <laughs> and there she lies on her back, quite comfortable, look at those eyes. <laughs> I think she was getting irritated with things, that piece of grass going in her ears and in her nose. Well, at least she's showing us her spot pattern and, and that little nick on her left side of the nostril. A little nick there. That we'd also use as a identifying feature on the nose, as you would with lions. Yes, see, that's quite a death stare, that. <laughs> She's showing us her softer side, huh? Not often he gets to spend time like this with uh, Shadulu. And see how she's chasing flies. Uh, still breathing fast and oh, trying to just get flies off of her skin there. Well, let's head you on over to David and see if any of those flat dogs are getting rid of the flies irritating them. Right, still enjoying the f beautiful birds, the starlings flying up in there, there. And below there, you'll see the dogs um, are still lying flat and they are not moving as yet they are not moving as yet still very very flat very flat not bothered by us and is what i said earlier the bellies look very full and if you're full and you're close to water and some nice shade and nobody's bothering you what should happen you just relax and have a snooze and you say life is good eh what I have noticed since I was here early in the morning, and we stayed for two hours plus, and since I also got here, I haven't seen these dogs drinking water. As much as we have a beautiful, nice water hole next to them, which is fresh water, ideally I think wild dogs are not very dependent on water, unless they have to. I don't think they're very much dependent on water. One in the morning went so close to the waterfront, got there, touched the water, and did not even bother to take a drop. And that would just why, unless they have to, they are not water dependent at all. Ginger, as the hippos are trying to answer you, I'm not sure it's me who will answer you, the hippos. Okay, it's me who will answer you, Ginger. And your question is, do wild dogs hunt during the day or at night? And the answer to your question is, in general, I would say nine out of ten times, wild dogs will hunt during the day. They're just very similar to cheetahs, who are very diurnal, very active in the day, because they will need the light to see where they're going, and they'll also want that open space. 
Well, I say nine out of ten. The one out of ten cases is when there's some very bright moon and the moonlight is good enough. Come on, hippos, stop scaring the wild dogs. They're having a snooze. My apologies, Ginger. And what should happen is if the moon is pretty bright out there at night, they have been known once in a while, and that's the one out of ten cases where they'll go for hunt. But more often than not, Ginger, they hunt during the day. I've just been crushing fingers. They may do something and see a bit of action on these dogs. Ginger, I don't know where you come from, but they're very similar to the wolves, if you'd call them. They're very similar to the wolves or some kind of coyotes or foxes. And my Rafiki James has a plant for you now. Well, we have many plants for everybody, and this is a particularly late example of the wild foxglove Ceratotheca triloba. Oh, a spider on it, where? Should I not hold it anymore? Okay. Near the top. Well, while you look at the spider, I shall just let it go. Oh, I can see it. I think it's a huntsman. Let me let go so that Craig can get a decent picture of the spider. This is uh, normally found in the middle of summer, not very often found this time of the year. And so what we have here is a, a late bloomer, as it were. And it's got rid of all its seeds already. And apparently you can use the leaves to treat painful stomach cramps and uh, period pains, funnily enough. I'm not sure how effective it is. But let's have a look now at the spider. Now, I saw I said it was a huntsman because it happens to be green, but I'm not sure that that's true. This could easily be a cra crab spider species that has disguised itself very cleverly on this plant, and I suspect it's waiting for ants which it's going to wait some time for because I can see to the ground that there are no ants climbing up this plant. And of course it's come to the end of its life cycle, the plant, not the spider. Paula, you say, yeah, another spider. In fact, I found what it's hunting and in fact it's about to catch one. Come over here, Craig. There are some green aphids, two green aphids. Oh, it's crawling around them. I'm not sure they are so minute. They're about a millimetre and a half across each. Can you see them there, just in front of my finger? Let me get a piece of grass to point with. Can you see them? There they are. Green aphids. And the spider's just behind them. Whether or not he's sneaking up on them, I'm not sure. He's, he's right there with them now. Come on. We want to see a live kill. No, the spider's moved off now. Phew, that was close, Avids. You were nearly savaged by a spider. In fact, the more you look at it, the more of these little green aphids you can see all over the place. They're crawling around. Gemma, it's a wild foxglove, Serra Tathika triloba. Wild foxglove, Serra Tathika triloba. Our mail line tracks have headed north into Buffel's Hook, so we're not going to be following him any longer. We'll take a leisurely stroll back towards the camp as the sun begins to set. So very interesting there. Lots of aphids around at the moment, and of course they drill into the sap of the plant that they're living on. Lots of different kinds of aphids, of course. And then they excrete that honeydew that the ants like to go and milk from. Let us carry on. I believe that Shadulu is behaving much like a presenter does in the middle of the day. <laughs> 
Well, I don't know. I'm, I don't really act like this. Uh, maybe some of the other ones do, but um, uh, my exercise is normally in the middle of the day. And, well, because Shadulu was uh, lying up next to her impala on quarantine today, I wasn't able to do my exercises, which is normally uh, six or seven laps around quarantine. So, thanks, Shadulu, but it was well worth it. I will definitely sacrifice that for watching you. And she's got quite a lot of black around on the head and on the neck as she lifted it up there. I'm not sure if that's a bit of stain from some of the entrails of the carcass that she's been feeding on. Looks like she's trying to clean it off now. I think it is. Uh, Sam Yu, who is, who is only nine years old, while well, you're becoming very big, um, I think that a leopard definitely has thinner skin than a lion, just for because of the sheer size of them. Um, you know, a leopard, this female leopard, she's probably in the region of, of about 60 kilograms, so it's about 130 pounds, whereas uh, a, a lion can be more than double that size, a female. So, just because of the sheer difference in size, I would say that the lion's skin is a lot thicker than hers. Um, but I think weight for weight or pound for pound, I think a female leopard would definitely be stronger than a female lion. But uh, oh, she's going to come walking just past us. I'll put my head down so that you can see her. She's coming past her right in the front of the vehicle disappearing off the side there. There we are. Hello girl. You going for another drink? Is she looking at us, eh? Are you going back for another drink or are you going back to your carcass? What are you thinking of, huh? If only we could tell what she's thinking. Would be wonderful. Right, well, we're just going to have to follow. Looks like she might be going back for a drink. That might be good to see as well. She's just sat down just behind us. So before I start up, I'm just going to wait just a little bit. There she goes again. I'm going to start up now. Okay, there might be a little bit of cracks and things as we drive over some of these branches. There's a big log that I'm sitting right on, so hold on everyone. Maybe a little bit more bumps. There we are. Where's she gone? There she is. She's just watching there. Just go forward slightly. Uh, I think we can safely say she's going to leave the thicket so let's head round and follow her it's the big log I was talking about there she is directly in front of us now I think she's going down for another drink oh yes that's going to be beautiful Carla Absolutely, thanks for your comment, saying your tail is so fluffy. That's one of the things that we can actually see very clearly on Shudulu. Very white, fluffy tail. On the end. She walks when she's not going to be going to eat something. She really puts it up nicely. So, it's beautiful. I wonder if we could get ourselves a reflection here. I'll stop just before I put the shadow on her. Let's just have a look from that point. Are you happy with that, Darby? Otherwise, I can keep going forward, but ah, oh, that's pretty, hey? She is in the shade. Not too much reflections. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, so it seems that like it's that kind of the uh, time of the day, everyone. Here's Shudulu having a drink, nice fluffy into the tail, but off to David with the uh, action with the dogs. 
All right, it's time now for the wild dogs to rise and show us a bit of action and show us what they're made of after having such a long day of sleep. They just rose up. Just see how when the first thing they do when they rise up is to greet each other and all what's going on there. Those are the greeting ceremonies. Those are the rituals they will do once they are up. I do not know whether they want to make a move. And this will be very interesting. After having them here the whole day, they might rise and just decide to take off. Next, you'll see the main dominant pair. What will happen now, they'll start urine marking. And I can smell the urine from who I am. And that will be done by the male and the female. The hippos keep interrupting every time these well dogs do something. And I would guess the one with the collar there could be one of the dominant ones. And that makes it easier for the male to be followed by people researching on it and getting the right data on their whereabouts, their behavior, to locate them if anything would happen to them. Jay, your question is, what is the... What, whoops. Something spoke to them there. I'm not sure it's a hippo again. Jay, your question is, what is the favorite prey of the wild dog? It depends on what part you are in Africa. And, for example, where we are here in Kruger National Park, the favorite prey for them are the impalas. I'm sure you know how the impalas look like. The impalas are number one. When you would go to East Africa, I don't know why they're behaving like that. When you'd go to East Africa, Jay, the number one uh, choice of prey would be the Thompson gazelle. So favorite ones here in Kruger National Park, Impala's number one, and in Kenya, East Africa, will be the Thompson gazelles. We'll try and go around a little closer to them there and find out what exactly they are up to. I do not know there's something they're trying to deal with. Let's just get closer and find out what is it. Is it a standoff between them and the hippo? Or what could be happening there? Let's see. There's definitely something going on there. Either there's a hippo in the water or a crow. What do you think, VM? Let's get a little close. There's a good angle, VM, for you. That's good. Let's find out what could be happening here on what the they're up to. They're just trying like to mock something in the water. They're like, come out, we're gonna kill you, or come out, this is gonna happen. And we can't see anything from where we are. VM, can you see the thing there? Just to raise my height and get a, a better vantage point to see if there's anything I can see. And my guess would be, could have been a heap of there. Yeah, I can see a hippo head there. I'm not sure that was the concern. So again, what did Carl ask? Oops. Uh, Carl, good question there. Do the wild dogs bark like the domestic dogs? I don't think so, Carla. What would happen when you hear them call, I'll try and see whether they can make a call for you for the wild dogs, but it's quite, quite different when they call. Just hang on for a minute and I'll let you know or just hear how the wild dogs just call as you enjoy that view there. It's a bit different and they're not as loud as the wild dogs. Just keep enjoying them there as I try and get you the uh, call. Yeah, can't get their call right now, but yeah, Carl, just to answer you, they're not as loud and they do not make the same call like the domestic dogs. Look at them coming very close to the car now. I don't know what they want to do. They're just coming surrounding us now. Look at them there. And I think it could be the time for the move. And if you look carefully, most of them are males. 
and it's time for them, like, thinking out to make a move, not knowing whether they would go and get some dinner. And very strange, after so many hours of spending time here in the water hall, I, near the water hall, I didn't see any one of them drink. You notice how they blend in very well there with the ground. As they walk, they're scaring away all the doves on the ground. And could be time for them to go look for food. The lead matchek to me, I think, is just trying to make a dash or a run. And what beautiful life they got after having so many hours of doing a lot of nothing or resting. Magic Dragon, you'd like to know if a pack of wild dogs would hunt a leopard. I would say so. I haven't seen one, but I would say so because, I mean, like a pack of eight, what we have now, it could be very easy to bring a leopard down. But leopards being so swift and being climbers of trees, which they easily do, and wild dogs will not be able to do that, I highly doubt that would be a possibility unless they bump into it without seeing and because of what you call predator competition, yes, they, they may they may they may hunt a leopard and just again to make sure all the prey around them is their food. But I haven't had one particular case of that happening. Still going and I think it's time now for them to start either planning or, you know, thinking of some early dinner or making plans to get some dinner. How lucky to have had them. One very characteristic uh, of the wild dogs is the white tail. I have never seen a, you know, a wild dog without a white tail. All of them, all of them will always have that, I uh, would say, iconic white tail. They all got different patterns on their bodies and each one of them is different from the other. But we'll try and make a loop here and see where they could be going because it could be action time and uh, who, who knows. It has been a long time we have had them here at the one spot doing a lot of nothing. And I'm sure all the food they had earlier could be digested by now. This will be so exciting if you would see them having a bit of an action of any kind. Angie, you'd like to know if these animals are restricted or how far they can go. I'll tell you. We are in the wilderness, they do what they want, they go where they want, and they eat what they want, and they are entirely not restricted. And there's some of the dogs, or some of the animals I have known to have very, very huge home range. They have home ranges, and wild dogs are not territorial. They only become territorial if they're in a den, and they got the pups, they got their young ones with them there. But when they don't have any youngs or youngsters with them, and they're free to range, they sometimes do almost a whole 600 square kilometers of space through range moving from one place to another. So let's see what they want to do. If they want to come across the road there and they're still moving forward, you can see one running and they all now look like either to be jogging, building up some energy and building up a bit of pressure to have some action maybe shortly or later before it gets dark. And as I said earlier, they will need light to go for their prey. Let me just go a little closer, and this is becoming exciting now. We have had them being very flat for a long time, and whoo, thank you for moving a bit. It changes the whole dynamics for me to see, uh, you know, the wild dogs the whole day laying down, and now to see them move. Uh, Sorry, this has got our friends out there, which should be fine. And let me try and get you a good angle. And this is becoming exciting and 
entertaining every other minute. Eh? Still on the move, and as I said earlier, once they move, they do move, and I can tell you, they go fast. John, I agree with you, this has made your day, and I would say, this for now might have made my whole year. We'll see if I'll get other special settings than this, but if I don't, I would say this has made my whole year. Sorry, might be wrong angle there, friends of ours. And again, they, are, they keep going and it has cooled off and they'll always be more active early morning and early in the evening. Let's follow them a little bit and find out what their plans are. Eh? Joanna, how are you today? And you'd like to know what is the Swahili word for wild dogs? If you don't have a pen and paper, I would request you pick one or just use your phone. And it's a rather long name, a little difficult, but I'm sure you are a clever girl, you get it. And it is Umboa, M-B-W-A, and that means a dog. And because they're wild dogs, the other name will be M W. -A. I T U Umbua Mwitu, Joanna. Umbua Mwitu, that translates to wild dogs in Swahili. Still on the move, as I told you, they move fast. Eh? We are also not letting go, and you got to go with them. I hope, Joanna, you got that. Keep it somewhere and make sure you don't forget it. If you forget, come back to me. one is pretty close to us there and with their characteristic black noses the muzzles of the nose are black and the heads looks like of a hyena as much as they're not related to hyenas but the head looks like of a hyena but look at the sharp ears I've been talking about and see how they keep turning them up just to pick any slight sound any slight call So the senses of smell and sight, very good, but I think hearing to me is the best. Let's also get closer to them. And you never know what will happen or what could be in the bush there. Ramesh, your question is, have I ever seen a successful wild dog hunt. Yes, I have seen one in Serengeti and it was rather an unusual one because they brought down a fully grown zebra. That rarely happens, but they brought down a fully grown zebra. That was spectacular. It was very, very special. Really, they go for big game. Anything over 60 kilograms or say, give or take, uh, over 140 pounds in general, they really do that. But to see them bring such a big prey, it was very, very special. And before they killed this zebra, I can tell you, they give it a chase and what they normally do or what I remember them doing there was a herd of zebras about 20 that of them and when they decide to go for a hunt they go pop like say 20 because that pack was about 20 or 30 or so and they keep chasing they keep chasing and the one that's leading the hunt will zero in on one particular animal one particular prey and when that happens they will subdue it and bring it down very very quickly and what we'll do now let's just get close to that and anyway once they do that they'll start biting it and getting some chunks and cutting it from you know every place and out of fear and out of exhaustion and out of shock these animals will die and they'll eat it that's how that zebra was brought down This is epic. The wild dogs are on the move and we are also with VM on the move too. Let's find out what they will at the end of the day do.
Oh, and to the left, if you look carefully, we don't know what this might translate into, but yeah, look there. Sorry, folks, we got a water back there. We do not know what this will translate into, but there's a female water back there on our left or on your left of your screen, and the wild dogs are on our right, and you can hear all the noises going on there from the bars there, the Franklins and the Guineans. Everybody looks a bit worried, a bit uh, concerned. And on that bush where VM is showing you, that's where the wild dogs are. So what would want to happen, we'll have a very clear space between us and the dogs and see what they will do. And you can tell the water back is quite nervous, quite nervous. Who knows what will happen? What you're gonna do, well, let's move forward a little bit because once they notice the water back have spotted them, they might choose a different target. And I think this might be the case now. Let's find out. But as I told you, once they target on a prey, they go for it and because they got very long legs, if they can run and keep running. You've seen those Kenyans running in the Olympics, eh? In the marathon, eh? Okay, there they are. There they are. Sorry, we got some other cars in place, but nothing to worry. Look at them. Look at them. Let's get this, those two right close to us, right there right there he just sniffing looking if anything has to be done it has to be done before it gets too dark so they'll move this way and agree and like they say what has to be done depending on the leader but the water park is not very far from where we are and from where i am i think the water park is about 50 meters away from there, 50 meters, and they're taking different angles. In fact, there are three water bugs around here, and this could be an epic moment. Look at those two there, sorry, we've got friends of ours, or neighbors, also enjoying this very special sighting. I'm not sure, VM, do you see that water bug right there? I do not know whether it can see the dogs or not i'm not sure what's happening look how close they are they're about no what 10 meters away from that the 10 meters away from that water bag. i do not understand this now it could be a little concern a little bit of a challenge because this water bag are huge in size as i was saying before they really bring down anything over you know i mean most 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 of the Wild dogs will weigh anything 20, 25 kilos, the very big ones, 30 kilos, but these water bugs are huge. I highly doubt they will go for them, but in very dire straits or when the situation is very tight, they'll be known to go for them. You can see them poking out there, the water bug, and the water bugs are standing on their ground. Very good job there, VM. And they're just looking at them like, you know, what are you going to do here? You're not going to move. Sorry, there's a pole there. We're trying to get the best we can in this particular epic moment. VM, are you excited? Yeah, VM says this is something he hasn't seen for quite some time, eh? Look at the sound there and we're going to back up a little bit and see if there could be some change. This is exciting, exciting, exciting. So let's get a nice place to turn around and see what happens here. Eh? Hold on for one minute. This is becoming action packed for all of us. Eh? We're going to turn around and see what exactly 
these wild dogs want to do. And as I said earlier, they rarely go for very big prey, you know. They go to the sizes of the impalas, the cobs, tin box, uh, Thompson gazelles. But water bucks are rather big for them and they might, they might harm them, you know, they might hurt them when they decide to go for them. That's why you saw them having a standoff and the water buck didn't look very worried. Like, you make a move, you try, eh? and we're gonna poke you with your horns, eh? So let's find out. They just went in that direction there. VM, can you see them now? So, and they might be traversing back to our property in Juma, which will be very good news. All right, we're going to go right here. And how lucky they're going back to a transverse area in Juma. And the whole pack is still together. And another predator with my Rafiki Ruff is still with my Rafiki Ruff. Now look at this everybody, uh, Shadulu has now entered back onto quarantine, but all the squirrels, the mongooses, everybody is now shouting at her, and you see them scuttling for cover there on the termite mound, and it looks like there is a chance she might go back to the kill site. I thought we might have lost her after she had a drink at Galago Pan, but uh, Seems like she's still got an interest in that impala. Uh, and there she's just laid down. So I think let me just go forward a little bit and see if we can have a lovely picture of her with um, this beautiful light that is now starting. And I think it's going to be very pretty with her on that branch with the sun behind just making a very orange glow. <coughs> a pretty picture here and as she's sitting up on that log next to the termite mound with the sun behind her wow Bobby, how's that that is very pretty indeed and the squirrels uh, announcing that she's back there we go now the wildebeest have also spotted her with the, the impala across the other side as well. Everybody started starting to notice that she's there. There we are. Look at that complete focus on her. Oh, alarm calling. And that ain't a rat call. That's a real alarm call. Very relaxed. Eh? She's not worried. She knows she's got a bit of food waiting over there. Uh, not a worry in the world. Had a nice feed. She's had a nice drink. She's still got food waiting. Yes, these squirrels are going nuts. Yes, <laughs> Darby, check this one's tail. Look at him. He's really going nuts there. Get him there. There. Hey, yes, he's not happy. Eh? He wants that. Look at that. <laughs> oh, the squirrels are funny at the best of times, but they, now when they're doing that, it really just makes me laugh. Well, she's been rolling in buffalo dung as well. And that's what we've worked out is on her head and below her chin. I don't know what it is about buffalo dung, but it seems that that's something I've learned in the last couple of days. Hukumuri wasn't eating Shuduli's scat, it was actually buffalo dung, and now Shuduli's been doing the same, eating it and rolling in it. I don't know what it is about buffalo dung, they seem to really like. You get the smell on it, on them. She's got a bit of a buffalo dung mohawk at the moment. Very attractive. Okay, so Shadulu, very relaxed and a beautiful light. Let's head you on over to Dave. It seems his dogs are snuffing about. Yes, we are still following our wild dogs and they made a few attempts to kind of play about with those uh, 
water bucks there but i don't think they could have gone for either of them those water bucks are huge in size they're like 10 times heavier than these dogs here and chances are they would not go for them one big thing i'm gonna learn today i've seen exactly how a truck of a wild dog a wild dog looks compared to of the other predators say the lions and the leopards that one just like tossing on the ground and maybe having a little scratch and it's having its business there either also marking this territory that's the male they also sniff it he also does a bit of urine marking there and that's very very typical and i would guess this one i could be wrong but my guess is this could be the patriarch here or it could be the male of the breeding pair or the dominant pair in this pack of dogs still moving on the road and we're gonna keep following them and see what they might do before darkness comes eh? Mason, very good question. How many wild dogs are in a pack? And that number ranges from what we have now, eight. We have seen packs of 20. And the biggest or the largest pack I've seen was 65, 65. So that number will range from anything to as small as eight, going maybe up to 65. And I'm not sure the 65 were two packs that came together because that number was abnormally huge, but we saw them in a den. And it's either because it was a breeding den and they had to feed the pups. That's why they ended up being so many. But yes, Mason, that number could be anything eight up to 65 or so slowly going to the thicket and trying to imagine where they might be getting their dinner and we are not giving up slowly and carefully we are following them up to see what they will do what a day today eh? My Rafiki James is still tracking. We are not tracking anymore. We've given up tracking everybody. We have got some wildebeest, the herd, as I like to call it, the herd, here at uh, the Weirteller Dam. We are on our way home. It's dark, we're frustrated, uh, we're quite tired. Herbert and I have walked some 16 kilometers today, which is not too bad. And I believe now the time has come for me to sing the gummy bear song. <clears throat> there could be a buffalo around here, so what we're going to do is just move into the open so that when I start singing the gummy bear song, the buffalo doesn't emerge at high speed and stick its horn between my midriff. There was a buffalo here somewhere today, but he seems to have moved off. All right, I will stand on this log, shall I, Craig? Yes. Herbert, I'm afraid I have to sing. I've been told I need to sing. VM, who's in final control, is worried I'm going to be sued by Disney. Um, as a publisher once said to me, tell them to bring it on. I'm not changing the words a bit, Kirsten. I'm singing the Gummy Bear song as the Gummy Bear song goes. Well, no, I don't really remember it exactly, but it goes something like this. <clears throat> you ready, Herbert? Dashing and daring, courageous and caring, along with the secret of gummy berry juice. This is the word that I do not remember, but never fear. We're going to the chorus now. Gummy bears, dancing here and there and everywhere. High adventure that's beyond compare. They are the gummy, they are the gummy bears. Well, there it is. 
<laughs> Kirsten, Kirsten is now playing the sound of crickets in the final control. <laughs> Dashing and daring, courageous and caring, along with the secret of gummy berry juice. I wish I remembered the words from this point, but the chorus is coming right up over here. Gummy bears dancing here and there and everywhere. High adventure that's beyond compare. They are the gummy. They are the gummy, they are the gummy bears! Go to David. Yes, we almost saw those wild dogs bring down a tin box. It was very, very close. And you know how nice that could be an ending action for a day. But this tin box was pretty fast and it just took off. And wow, wow, my adrenaline levels just went shoop that high. And that tin box has a story to tell another day. Eh? So we're gonna follow them and find out where they might have gone because the standbook was just in that direction and before we could plan with them which time do we see it this way do we see it this way they're all gone and we saw the standbook surviving so we want to find out if they're still moving and i can tell you for a fact they basically need some dinner we're going to go right here and see there they are we've just spotted one of them so let's go in here and find out what could be happening but what an awful fact they really and seriously need some dinner eh? so you're going to enter these thick bush bushes here or these thickets that we don't have in kenya we don't do this what i've been doing here in kenya and again comparing the game drives in kenya and the game drives here in south africa this is one big difference to be able to get into the thickets like this and follow some interesting game so just trying to avoid doing any or lots of damage to the short trees that are coming up. This is an exciting day. Eh? Very good stuff for me. Tell your question is how exactly do wild dogs kill their prey? And they first identify their prey. And what will happen is once they know what they want to bring down and they identify, for example, be it herd of impalas, they'll first start chasing and they start like a little jog and they keep going. But the one at the very front there, the leader of them all, will zero in or decide that's the guy we are going to bring down and they concentrate on that one and as i was saying earlier they got very long legs and that one gives them an advantage of being able to run and run for long and once they get so close to the prey they'll when you jump onto it and either bite some parts of the body and they just start pulling it and tearing it together and after such a long run and the exhaustion of running and of course the shock of having like 10 15 wild dogs around you i mean that just brings you down that's how they hunt they're not lay they're not like stock and lay ambush like leopards or stock like lions then they let you know we are there and like let's go let's run until you can't run anymore righty hopefully that helps once your question Gemma as you get close and find out where they might have gone and once in a while we have seen them bring in babies of what James got now Yes, we've got the Wilden Beestons and they are alarm calling at us. I shall be silent and then hopefully I shall induce them to alarm call. There we go. <laughs> we've been having a conversation while you've been away. <laughs> Twenty-six I counted in this herd. 
I think it's just a wonderful little herd. The thought of them being set upon by a pride of lions fills me with a sense of sadness and dread. So I'm glad they're not being set upon by a pride of lions. These are wildebeest, in case you were wondering. Same ones we saw earlier this morning on our walk. They've come all the way across here. They've had their evening drink at the pan. They watched the performance of the gummy bears down on the uh, log down there, which uh, you unfortunately had to watch. And uh, now they're going after their evening ent ent evening's entertainment up onto the clearings there. The youngsters will have to do their homework and the adults will talk about adult wildebeest things. Possibly read the newspaper. Arlaramua, you're looking at the sky saying that the colours are beautiful. They are. They're a beautiful sort of subtle purple and a pink, some a l'orange. It's a stunning evening, it really is. The buffalo is nowhere to be seen, by the way. I don't know where he is. Right, that's going to be it from Bushwalk this evening. Let us go back to Ralph. When you're with Ralph, please tell him that it is Shidulu, not Shiduli, Shidulu. Okay? And go. Okay, bye, James. Bye. And uh, don't come back. Right, <laughs> yes, we know it's Shidulu. Okay, dog. But I also think that that wasn't the Gummy Bear song. We heard something there in the background that was something not Gummy Bears. I don't know. I need to hear a repeat of that and just double check. I've got uh, two kids of my own, and I know that uh, I know Gummy Bears very well. And Kirsten's saying that, yeah, maybe it's a cry for help from James. Maybe we need to just sit him down and have a chat with him a bit later and see that everything's all right. But uh, no, <laughs> I think everything's all right with Shadulu, not Shaduli. She seems very comfortable, very relaxed. And one of those animals that, uh, for me, if you want to see the, the most relaxed animal out there, you've got to see a leopard sleeping on a stump because... I think it's just like a human on a lazy, a lazy, what are those? Lazy boy couches. And they just look so comfortable. And especially here where she's, we know that she's got everything that she needs. There's not a care in the world, except for maybe the odd pesky hyena, which I've also heard just started calling now. I'm sure they're going to be coming looking for that leftovers of that impala. But it doesn't look like Shadulu is uh, terribly worried. Look at that. Lying face down on the branch. And the impala has given up the alarm snorting. I think he's he's even turned around and carried on feeding. Squirrels, I think, gone in its little hole in the marula. Stopped chirping away there. It was constantly alarm calling. So, Shudulu has now got her peace and quiet. She's been after all day. You know, the monkeys barking at her, the impala, the squirrels, birds, everybody's just making a racket. And you can see how irritated she gets. And now it's cooling off, so she'd be probably very happy. I would be anyway if I was a leopard and you finally get left alone. And you've got a full belly, you've had a drink, and you're in a comfortable spot. What more could you ask for? All right, I think everyone, we're going to switch over to infrared now. It's getting low light conditions, so we're going to switch over now. There we go. So we don't have to put any spotlight or anything over onto her. We can see her perfectly clearly with the infrared night vision. Let's hope that she gets up and actually does something for us now that we've done that. Maybe heads over towards the kill and has a bit of a chew on the last little bit that's left otherwise it definitely is going to be hyena and that will finish it off i'm sure there won't be anything by the morning those hooded vultures are still there but they're not feeding on it at the moment i 
Uh, Saskia, thanks for your comment, saying she lives up to her name, hanging around termite mounds all day. Absolutely. Now that's obviously, you see why the Shangans like to wait for a good amount of time when they have the, when they first meet the little cubs and give them a chance to show their character and, um, and then name them accordingly after, you know, a good six to eight months. Give them a chance for that character to shine through. And, well, they've obviously picked the perfect name for this female leopard. She obviously was up each and every termite mound every time they saw her. So, And she's still carrying on with that trait. And the perfect, perfect name for this leopard. Well, she's not up the termite mound right now, but uh, she's in the, on the log right next to it. We heard an owl come out just now while it was calling, a wood owl. It does that So all the night birds starting as well, starting their calls as the chorus of the day starts to fade into the new chorus of the night. And of course you've still got the Natal spur fowls which uh, Sometimes just don't know when to be quiet. They're a little bit like the Cape turtle does. Especially when you've got a full moon, they'll call all night. They get confused and they still think it's daytime. Very silly birds are the Cape turtle doves. <laughs> There's been a lot of bronze wing courses out here on uh, quarantine this afternoon as well, which is not usual. They normally only really spotted during the night hours. A ground bird, very similar to the spotted thick knee, a little bit smaller than them. Pretty bit wonderful setting. Now, Malika, I believe that um, Shudulu hangs around termite mounds, well, often going up them because it's it's a perfect point of view um, to get yourself up out of the long grass um, and it's normally quite comfortable to lie up on the top of it so I think she's using it as a dual purpose and she probably discovered that at a very young age that if she went up she had a nice view above the grass and she was probably very little at the time uh, and so shorter than everyone else and didn't couldn't you know like a little kid that's jumping up behind a crowd of people trying to see over their heads well she found herself a a nice uh, point where she could get up above everything and be able to see it from a lovely angle and uh, nice and high and nice and comfortable as well and I'm sure then she's just decided that well those are perfect spots every time to go up and check out from so I, I just think that that's a learned behavior from uh, her, you know from her cub years and especially if the Shangans have called her that she would have do, been doing that in her first couple of months and so that, that speaks volumes to me as to what she's learnt in, those, in the early years or the early months. Well, still super relaxed. Back leg spread at the back there and uh, just head over on that very flat and smooth trunk. A couple of birds calling, there's the odd impala still rutting. There they are all around. And the bush noises never cease. It just ch It's the change of the guard. Now what's it? What have you heard? Shudulu? When they put their ears back like that, it's a bit of a, you know, an anxious type mood or body language. Uh, not too much of a worry. Back to sleep. Now, everyone, I'm not sure that Shudulu is going to go anywhere anytime soon. But uh, let's, uh, let's head you on over to David and see what's happened with those wild dogs. Do you still have them, Dave? Well, the wild dogs have finally said, David, we have given you enough attraction and it's time for us now to be allowed to go and have some private dinner. 
and it was a very close attempt of getting a chain block down there and it survived and they just went into thickets that were very even very very difficult to drive through but that was something we weren't able to bring it on camera on very good time because i think they just bumped in this tin box just in the middle of nowhere and it's time now i'm telling vm i want to go home slowly and get my pen and paper and document today as one of my biggest days can't remember which viewer said you know the wild dogs made his or her day and as i said the wild dogs made my ear that was nice and something epic for me that I want to remember for a very long time eh? and you never know what direction they might have gone and if they went this way in the same direction we are going we might bump into them again And Anna Marie, you'd like to know if wild dogs have a rabies problem in Kenya? Yes and no. And I'll tell you, the biggest threat or the biggest concern of wild dogs in the whole of Africa is man. And people have always seen them as pests, as vermin. They just hate them for no apparent reason. I haven't seen wild dogs hurt anybody and it's very very rare for them even to go for livestock it's only when the situation is so bad they have been documented or recorded to have either gone for cows or for domestic dogs or goats or sheep and it has always been assumed if they have rabies and they bite the normal domestic dogs they will give them rabies but not one case i know where wild dogs gave um the normal domestic dogs rabies and a marine not one i know of but a very good question there and the school's off now could be a very good time for either the wild dogs to keep searching for food or other predators said the leopard like shidulu to still look for more dinner for the night and my Rafiki Raf still have Shidulu with him thanks Rafiki Dave and well she is not exactly uh, performing for us at the moment but well, we can't complain because we had a couple of days there where I thought all the leopards had disappeared off Juma completely, never to return. And well, then this morning, Shadulu put on a show for us. So she's allowed to have her snooze. And I'm just sitting here waiting also and hoping that there'll be some hyenas that show themselves. So I'm not just sitting and watching Shadulu with no clan in mind because we're not far from that kill site and she might get up and move at any second as well you know you know her kind of habit she has a bit of a catnap and I wouldn't put it past her in, in five minutes or so that she gets up and runs off towards that kill site or just does something out of the ordinary that's that's the nature of this particular cat it seems a, a few times that I've seen her she definitely is quite erratic, but for the time being, she really is getting into La La Land there. I wonder what she's dreaming about. Do you think it's about Impala or other leopards? I wonder what else she could be dreaming of. What do you think she's dreaming of? Gummy bears. Oh, you know, Kirsten says gummy bears. Maybe that's exactly it. James was giving a fantastic non-rendition. I'm still convinced that wasn't gummy bears, but uh, let's let's go with that. Oh, looks like she's saying, "Yep, gummy bears." I wonder if she dreams of bouncing around like they do. And she's had her magic juice this morning, a bit of impala, and it doesn't seem like it's making her very bouncy at all. Anything bouncy is the little end of her hand there is the reflex just 
kicks in and she has a little flick of the of the paw. See, it gets a little bit grainy there when you when you go in on the infrared, but it's still fantastic quality. And right in this darkness, it's almost we're in the last few minutes of light. That sun is long gone. We've just got a bit of a glow. Nels, it's not really that dangerous for her to not sleep up in a tree because she's um she's even though she's asleep and she, and she looks like she might be in deep slumber, if if anything had to come sort of towards her there, she'll hear it very quickly. And she's got a tree right next to her that she could potentially just bolt up as well. She could go on top of the termite mound, as her name suggests. But um, yeah, it's just her alertness. Even in deep sleep, she'll wake up very fast. Um, so I don't think that anything could get anywhere near her without her realizing soon enough. So I wouldn't say that uh, it's dangerous. They often sleep on the ground. Even little Chalamba, and Tumbi's, uh, Tandi's little cub, also sleeps on the ground quite regularly. So they're not, they're not, you know, always sleeping up in the tree. In fact, I would say that they more so sleep on the ground, just under a thicket or in a bush. I mean, it's nice and shady, bit of flat ground, and they just plop themselves down. I think only the lion can plop themselves down better than a leopard. And they literally throw themselves on the floor. But uh, leopards, yeah, they do sleep pretty well uh, as well. And I think the lions are king of sleep. Definitely. You see, there's still the one eye every now and then opening, and those ears are constantly moving. You see? See how alert she is? She's probably heard maybe there's some hyena, hyenas on their way. Oh, a bit of grooming. So, and the reason why also, everyone, that I, you know, you might wonder, why am I just sitting with a leopard? Well, you know, we might not see her for the next week. And so we've got to just take it all in when we can. And especially with her being right here on quarantine where it's lovely and open and we can actually see her nice and clear. Very often she's just in the thickets. Oh, here we go. What are you going to do? Oh, lovely stretch. Now, Bergman girl, absolutely. Um, leopards do have particular characters. Each individual is um, different to the next as she's doing a little bit of her daily duties. And so, Shudulu has got a really erratic character, and that's what's quite uh, intriguing about her. She never sleeps for long. She never lies down for long. She never walks for long. She never, everything is just all over the place. And that's what I love. And that's why I love being around her. I think now she's making her way towards the kill site. So we might get her. Who knows? Maybe she'll even drag it back up the tree. Maybe she'll have a bit more to eat. It's that time. She's had a lovely rest, lovely drink. Now she's sauntering on over towards where there is quite a lot of meat still left, although it is pretty much a carcass at the moment, but there's still all that neck that she could get into. So this is very good news for us for the last little bit of the show. She's marking everywhere as well. I'll just give her, you see, every tree is a lavatory. Yeah. There we are. Definitely not in a hunting mode with that tail up like that. When you see the tail up like that, that's a leopard that's not hunting. She's quite happy, giving away her position as she walks through the open plains. And you see those lap wings now, crowned lap wings, having a go at her. They'll probably dive bomb her a bit. There they are. They used to dive bomb us on the rugby field. Now, Daryl, I agree with you. We've had a very good host today with uh, cool cat Rafiki Dave. He's been wonderful, hasn't he? And it's so nice to have the Kenyan down here with us. Um, 
they are such friendly people. And I know that Dave said one of the things that he really liked about uh, coming to South Africa was how welcome uh, he felt. Well, I can tell you that there's nowhere that you will feel as welcome as when you go to Kenya. The people are so friendly there that I think it's pretty hard to beat. Now, I'm going to just catch up here with Shudulu. I think she's going in for some meat. Okay, let's head you on back to Dave while I get closer to Shudulu. And um, let's just have a look here first. I just want to see. I think she's getting in next to the meat there. So let's just... She's just here. So I wonder if that's all right, Kirsten. If we just carry on because she's right here at the meat. There, she's having a feed now. Is that all right, Dave? There we go. You see, it's quite difficult to know because we're in infrared and I can't see everything that that camera is seeing. There we go. Now oh, she's having a bit of dinner. The last little bit of meat that's left. Getting tuck it, tucked into that neck. The ribs still showing, but all the meat is gone from the lower section. I need the legs are still there, the spine, the ribs, a little bit of meat around the ribs, and then the neck and the head. I'm really struggling and fighting with it, eh? I'm gonna have to hold it down. Use that carnassial shear of hers to slice through the meat. I start crunching a few bones, I'm sure. Beautiful sight, that. I know it's always a shame for the animal that's died, but um, it's just such a wonder that that protein and that meat can be transferred into the next, and um, there's not going to be a single ounce of this impala wasted, that I can assure you, because whatever she leaves, well, as you saw, there were quite a few vultures around. They'll have their bit if there's anything left by the morning, but I can guarantee you the hyenas will clean this up. Well, Kathy in Ohio, I think that it might be Impala. I think this is the second impala that I know that she's killed. So I think her favorite meat might just be impala. And uh, while it does make uh, for a lot of leopards a favorite food, I know in some areas, especially mountainous areas, they prefer baboon. It's, I think it's pretty much area specific. Some other places, warthogs. Um, but whether they prefer it or not is, is a you know, I don't know if it's about the meat itself or if it's just specializing in ex the actual hunt of them, being able to catch them and kill them. Um, and that's where I think it, it all depends on what's most uh, the, the most dominant prey species in the area, plus then the evolution of, of the hunting techniques on uh, in that particular area as well. So, I mean, for instance, if you were to take Shudulu, and place her in a different park altogether. So you had to translocate her, dart her now, and move her down to the Addo Elephant National Park, for instance. There are no impala there, and they didn't occur there naturally. So she would have to adapt and, and find a different prey meat, a uh, prey animal, and I'm sure that she would find the easiest animal uh, to kill that is in the most abundance, and there's lots of warthogs down there, um, and so she might, you know, that might then become her new favorite, etc. But I think it's definitely more so the, the hunting technique and, and how to kill the animal rather than the actual taste uh, for the meat that they're eating. Not really getting too much out of it at the moment. Be lots of hair and stuff that she's going to get through with the skin. Okay, so she's going to continue here with her meal, carrying on. And, well, Rafiki Dave, where are you and how are you doing? I'm right here. 
I'm well, and to Shidulu, bon appetit, enjoy your dinner. And that one makes me feel it's time for dinner also. I'm thinking it's time to go for dinner, but before then, we're trying to see if we might bump into anything nocturnal. I'm thinking of either chameleons anywhere, see any chameleon around this area, or bunnies, scrub hairs that will come out and now start taking command of the darkness while everybody else is going to bed. I would guess my wild dogs doesn't look very bright and not enough light for my wild dogs to go for a hunt. So I think it's time for the nocturnal animals to come out and give us a final show or a final look before we go home for dinner. Eh? VM, what are the common chameleons you might see if you're lucky? What's that? Flat necked. Yeah. All right. VM tells me if you're lucky, we might see a flat necked chameleon. So. We're shining our light on all the trees possible, looking on the road for scrub hairs. Feels very quiet at this hour. Gemma, make sure you don't miss my important Swahili classes because you're gonna miss some very, very crucial and important words in your life. And Rafiki, means a friend, amici, amigo, that is Rafiki. Rafiki means a friend. I hope you got it, and it's R-A-F-I-K-I, -I, Rafiki, which translates to a friend. So if you watch our shows or you watch our game drives, we won't call you a viewer now, we'll call you a viewer and a Rafiki. And Gemma, that will take me back to my Rafiki, who got Shidulu having dinner. Yes, and we were just chatting now that, uh, well, Shidulu now eating here, and, and it's nothing to do about what she's eating, it's just eating. It's starting to make Darvi and myself here rather hungry. And, uh, well, we can smell a barbecue going on just not far from here as well. So it's really getting our stomachs going, and uh, we're ready for dinner as well. Everyone's hungry. Seems Tandy's the only one tucking in. No, why am I saying Tandy? Shudulu, excuse me. Now, Max, yes, it does. It's not as strong as the males, um, but it does It does have that popcorn-y smell to it. But uh, you can definitely smell the males uh, quite a bit stronger than the females. I think that maybe it's because of this sort of testosterone in the urine. I'm not quite sure. I haven't really tested it, but I can, I can tell you for sure that uh, I have smelled females versus males, and it's it, uh, definitely stronger with the males, but you can still smell that popcorn-y smell with the females. It's just not quite as pungent. Um, and even little genets, they also have a rather popcorn-y smell to them as well when they when they urinate. It's not um, definitely not a, a, almost as the real product uh, of, the, of the leopard popcorn. That's the real deal. That's cinema popcorn. Whereas the genet is maybe like microwave popcorn. You know, it's not really the real stuff. But, uh, yeah. Uh, fascinating. And lovely that Shadulu's come back now for a feed to end off a wonderful day with her. It has been absolutely fascinating. Going through this whole day in the life of a leopard where she made a kill this morning and, uh, trying to keep it up in the tree, dropping down onto the ground, all those vultures arriving, and now this afternoon where there's just the two hooded vultures remained, the rest of them I think headed off to maybe that other impala carcass, I'm not quite sure, but they all moved off, leaving the carcass pretty much for Shadulu's return, which has now come to fruition after she went for a lovely drink uh, or two at uh, Galago Pan, and wow, Dave, with those wild dogs, 
That was wonderful too. So when we got back to camp this morning, it was smiles all round. After two, three days of very, very little happening uh, on the on the fields of Juma, we were really uh, testing our skills, and uh, it was putting us, uh, making us quite frustrated with all the the tracking and finding all the new tracks and and everything but with no product at the end of it it can really test your patience as a guide but that's where the perseverance you need to keep on keeping on and eventually you get these wonderful sightings like this which makes it then all worthwhile and i said to dave it's um this morning it's pretty much like going fishing one day and you don't even get a bite and the next day you haul them out. Every time your hook touches the water, the fish are jumping for it. So that's an end to a wonderful day. Thank you to all the wonderful people in FC. Thanks to all the cam ops. And thanks to Dave and uh, James with his gummy bears. And most of all, thank you to the viewers. Because without you, this wouldn't be possible. Now, goodbye and see you soon all. Laters.